So a quick recap. We've started talking about molecular bonds and we know that the reason that atoms want to bond to each other has everything to do with the number of electrons that are in their outer electron shell, that atoms behave as if their heart's desire is to have a full outer electron shell. One of the ways that they can solve it is with a covalent bond. In a covalent bond, two atoms get close enough that they can share a pair of electrons. A pair of electrons, meaning one atom brings an electron to the bond and, ex and shares one from the other atom. So let's look at these guys. Let's look at oxygen. Oxygen has got two vacancies here and it's got six electrons out there. So it can come to another oxygen, for example, and say, hey, I will share this electron with you if you will share one of yours with me. And in that way, with sharing of a pair of electrons, they can end up with almost a full outer electron shell. Then we said that um, covalent bonds came in two different types. The example here of a water molecule shows uh, polar covalent uh, bonds. So here we've got little tiny hydrogens. Each one of them has a single proton and one electron in the outer, the only electron shell. And here we've got a big old oxygen, big in comparison. It's got eight protons plus neutrons and eight uh, electrons with six in its outer shell. Um, and in this case, oxygen acts like a bully and instead of sharing the pair of electrons even Stephen with the hydrogen, it's keeping this pair of electrons more than half the time and keeping this pair of electrons more than half the time. And that keeping a pair of electrons more than half the time means it keeps more negative charge on, on the oxygen end of this water molecule, H2O, right? Um, and each hydrogen has a slightly positive charge. This is an excellent example of a polar covalent bond. We said that in a non-polar covalent bond, the pair of electrons get shared evenly. So between <clears throat> carbons and oxygens, those are non-polar covalent bonds. And when there's non-polar bonding of a molecule, then there, there is not only no net charge for the molecule, but there's also no unevenness of the negativeness and positiveness on that molecule, All right? And I said that the way uh, someone shared with me that they remember which one is polar and which one's nonpolar, I think it's difficult to remember. Um, polar has a puller, meaning that in a polar covalent bond, one of the atoms is pulling the electrons towards it more than half the time. So we left off there. Now, let's talk about ionic bonding. I told you that the reason that atoms bond to each other has a lot to do with the number of electrons in their outer electron shells and, um, and that atoms behave as if what they really want is to have a full outer electron shell. Let us look at poor sodium for a moment. Oh, look at poor sodium, okay. Sodium has got a single electron in its outer electron shell. It has just, just one electron out there. Now that puts it in a difficult situation. It has got seven vacancies in its outer electron shell, but it only has one electron. Oh, what does that mean? That means that if sodium wanted to, it could form a single covalent bond with another atom, but if it forms a single covalent bond, it still is nowhere near having a full outer electron shell. So in despair, sodium simply gets rid of that single electron. Here's the sodium atom when it has no charge. It'll get rid of that electron and look, Oh, now it's got a full outer electron shell. I'm sorry, there's a typo in this image. I got to find a new image that's like it. These two electrons are kind of out of place. They, they belong right there in the outer electron shell, right? So sodium is relatively happy. Now it has a full outer electron shell. But in giving away an electron, 
it now has one fewer electrons than it has protons. So it has become an ion and the sodium ion is a positively charged ion. Now, where did that electron go? Well, if chloride is nearby, chloride is like, you wanna get rid of that electron? Well, that's perfect for me. Why? Because chloride is missing a single electron in its outer electron shell. Chloride, chlorine could, as an atom, form a covalent bond with something, or if it's next to a sodium and sodium's handing out electrons, it could simply accept an electron. When it accepts an electron, look, now it is an ion, and the chloride ion has one extra electron. It has one more electron than it has protons, and so it is a negatively charged ion. Now that sodium and chloride, those, those are ions, they have got opposite charges. They're like uh, I don't know, magnets or something like that, and they get attracted to each other. And opposites attract in the atomic world like it does in Hollywood, and so they're attracted to each other. I think I have, yeah, I've got this little, what is this, a GIF? So here we've got sodium with fluorine. And sodium, you'll see at the beginning, it's got this one extra electron, and it's like, I'm just gonna give it away. And fluorine says, I would like that electron, that'd be swell for me, right? So when sodium gives this electron to fluorine, then sodium becomes positively charged, it's an ion. Fluorine becomes negatively charged, and now they're attracted to each other. This attraction between atoms or molecules because of opposite charge is called an ionic bond. Wait, ionic bond. I keep seeing an ionic bond, which sounds like anion, but I don't mean anion, I mean an ion. Okay, all righty. So how are ionic bonds different? There's no sharing of a pair of electrons. It's just one atom giving one away, and now they're oppositely charged, and then they're attracted by electricity instead of a covalent bond. Now we've got the third kind of molecular bond that we're going to talk about, and it is called a hydrogen bond. Strangely, Hydrogen bonds don't always require hydrogens, okay? I think that's true. But the ones we're gonna be talking about always have a hydrogen involved. Hydrogen bonds start out with molecules that are constructed with polar covalent bonds. Let's look at this water molecule one more time. H2, here's a hydrogen, here's a hydrogen, here's an oxygen, H2O, the hydrogens come off at slightly an angle. So the oxygen is holding the pair of electrons for more than half the time, which means that the oxygen end of the molecule will be slightly negatively charged. I've got it in brackets because it's not, it's not minus one, it's just slightly negatively charged. And each hydrogen is slightly positively charged, okay? So because of the polar covalent bond, even though an individual water molecule has no charge. An individual water molecule has the same number of electrons and protons, okay? So the water molecule itself has no charge, but the distribution of charge is uneven, and that creates parts of the water molecule that are slightly negative and parts of a water molecule that are slightly positive, right? So right now, we're not looking at a hydrogen bond yet. This is not a hydrogen bond. This is a water molecule that has polar covalent bonds. Now let's look at hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds is the very weak attraction right here. You can see it's usually represented by a dotted line instead of a solid line, dotted line, dotted line. A very weak attraction between the slightly positive ends of this water molecule and the slightly negative end of the adjacent water molecule. So remember, water molecules are put together by polar covalent bonds, but one water molecule is attracted to an adjacent water molecule by this very slight charge difference. Why is this not an ionic bond? 
right? I'm talking about opposite charge attracting adjacent water molecules. Why is this not ionic bonding? The reason this is not ionic bonding is because no one's given away an electron. The water molecule has all of its electrons. They're all fine. This water molecule has all of its electrons. They're all fine, right? So no one has given away an electron. What's happened is the charge of this water molecule is unevenly distributed, making this slightly negative and that slightly positive. So in a way, each water molecule is a little bit like a bar magnet. You know, a bar magnet has got a positive end and a negative end. And if you try to put the two positive ends next to each other, they'll push each other away. But if you put a positive and a negative together, click, they'll click together, okay? Now, this is not so much a click as like a kind of vague attraction. Remember that hydrogen bonds are the weakest of the bonds. Each one of these hydrogen bonds, tremendously weak. It's just that there are so many of them in uh, water-based systems that they end up, like Velcro, creating a very positive, um, a very strong net bond, right? <clears throat> um, like think about Velcro, each individual little hook tremendously weak, but when you put two things together by Velcro, you literally can't pull them apart. You have to peel them apart, right? When you try to pull them apart, you're trying to pull all of those hydrogen bonds apart at the same time, can't do it. You gotta break hydrogen bonds just a couple at a time. While we're talking about polar covalent bonds and water, uh, let's just mention why water is such a good solvent. Water is not, it, not everything will dissolve in water, but lots of things do. What dissolves in water? Polar molecules dissolve in water and ions dissolve in water, right? Why do some things like salt, let, let's look at salt. This is table salt, sodium chloride, table salt. Why does it dissolve in water so well? Because the sodium is positively charged. So when that ion, a little, little atom, is sitting there in the water, the negatively charged ends of water molecules arrange themselves around the positively charged sodium. And look over here, the chloride is negatively charged and the positively charged sides of the water molecules surround it. So that's why Water makes a very good solvent for things that are polar or things that have a charge. Um, polar molecules and ions uh, will dissolve in water because water is polar. Nonpolar molecules like, um, like lipids are mostly nonpolar. Anything that is nonpolar will not dissolve in water. Uh, things that dissolve in water are also described as hydrophilic. Hydro means water, philic means love, so they love water. Hydrophobic is our word for describing things that don't like water, right? There are lots of molecules that don't like water. If you try to put oil and water together, you can, you can heat them up together, you can blend them for 10 minutes after you've heated them up, and still you would find that when you sit it on the counter, the oil will separate from the water. And the reason is that oil is made out of hydrophobic molecules and they are trying to avoid the water. Remember that hydrogen bonds, they're the weakest type, but there can be lots of them. And a good example is DNA. This is a teeny, teeny, tiny bit of DNA. How small a bit? Well, one of your, one of your chromosomes of DNA can have 50 million base pairs. How big is this snippet? This is a base pair. So one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is maybe 50 base pairs. So this is one one millionth of a molecule of DNA. DNA is the largest of the biomolecules, right? And DNA is made out of two strands. We also call them two strings, okay? So here is one string of DNA, and it's organized as a helix or like a spring. Here's the other one. 
And these two strings of DNA are attached in the middle by hydrogen bonds. And 50 million base pairs, 50 million hydrogen bonds holding it together. All right, we're gonna start here at the beginning of the next video.